Welcome to another episode of Arbitration Life. I am Janet Brin. And I'm Hannah Dumas. The BBI IAC is proud to sponsor for the second year the annual Beast Moot happening from March 31st to April 6, 2023, where they'll be celebrating their 30th anniversary. We can agree that when it comes to resolving international commercial disputes, arbitration is the preferred method of choice. And so what better way but to train law students. The Vismuth's goal is to foster the study of international commercial law and arbitration and provide a practical training to students for resolving international business disputes. The moot will take place in person in 2023. Hannah, you were an arbitrator in last in the last Vismuth. How was that? Thank you. Well, that was great. Thank you for the question, Jeanette. Uh, as always, like as every year, uh, it's always amazing. Uh, the only thing is for the VSmooth and the VC Smooth, it's been uh, online. Yeah. So uh, I've only participating, uh, participated remotely. So I'm really looking forward to do it again in person and, and to go to the Annex too. Uh, and now for uh, our audience uh, who is not necessarily familiar with the moot, uh, let me give you a bit more information about it. So the VS moot is probably the most famous uh, moot competition in international uh, arbitration. Um, and it includes two phases uh, and is aimed at train um, advocacy. So the first phase is the writing of memoranda for claimant and respondent. And the second phase is the presentation of arguments in oral hearings uh, before arbitration practitioners. Um, so usually the exercise uh, requires determining questions of contracts uh, flowing from a transaction relating to the sell uh, or purchase of goods under the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods and other uniform international commercial laws, so this famous CISG. Uh, the dispute is resolved in the context of an arbitration under uh, a specified set of arbitration rules. Uh, and I was myself in Muti in 2013 with the Paris Bar team. Uh, so it was at the time the 20th anniversary of the Muti and the following year was my first time acting as an arbitrator. So uh, I very much, very much look forward to next year to celebrate the 30th anniversary. Wow. So, well, today our guest today is one of the directors of the VSMUT. He is also a professor of international dispute resolution at Bucerius Law School in Hamburg and chairman of the board of directors of the German Arbitration Institute. He is a member of the advisory board of the Vienna International Arbitration Center and the Arbitration Institute of the Finnish Chamber of Commerce, as well as Germany's national correspondent to the Eucitral for arbitration. As an independent arbitrator, he has sat uh, in more than 90 arbitrations involving parties uh, as well as state parties. He's regularly listed as one of the leading arbitration experts in Germany, and he's one of the most in-demand arbitrators in Germany. He acts regularly as expert in arbitration proceedings. Uh, he has published widely in the field of international uh, arbitration, dispute resolution and contract law. Please welcome Professor Stefan Krull. Hi Stefan, welcome to Arbitration Live. How are you? Thank you very much. Hi Hannah, hi Janet. Hi. We're definitely, definitely very excited to have you on our show today. So where are you right now? Uh, you're in I'm Germany? In, presently, I'm in Cologne. Yeah, The background is the university in Hamburg, but I'm sitting oh. in my office in Cologne. Cheating. OK. Yeah. Well done, though. You are two places at once. I like it. Hmm. Uh, sounds great. Well, uh, we're definitely looking forward to the VSMUT in Vienna next year in person. The 30th anniversary. It's going to be something. So am I. Yeah, After three years watching your computer yeah, or two years watching the computer last year we start restarted a little bit i'm really looking forward to seeing in particular uh students but also old friends as arbitrators back in vienna wonderful so stefan i'm really curious to know what inspired your career in the legal sector and how did you get started in arbitration how much time do you have <laughs> 
No, oh, it's uh, I'm coming from a from a university background. My father is a professor in theoretical physics, but he moved very soon into administration. And he said he should have studied law. And when I was in the end trying to decide what to do, whether to go into science or to do law, I decided then to go for law. And I've never regretted it. Uh, um, Perhaps one of the events was at school, we had a discussion and I found the way the teacher handled it so unfair that I decided, okay, that should not happen to you again. And then moved into law. And since we always had a lot of foreigners at home, my father always brought foreign guests he invited to the university back home, uh, that they got to see how a German family lives. And for us, it was very interesting to be exposed to completely different views. It was clear for me that I wanted to do law, but then somehow international law. The one thing with law is normally you're a little bit restricted to the jurisdiction you study in. And so I started off uh, after the first two years in Germany, spending in Geneva, and from there just all developed. I was very lucky I had uh, as professor for private international law, Pierre Lalive. I don't know whether wow. you still still know the name yeah he was the founder of the relief law firm and he was just extraordinary uh, and so coming back to germany i decided to go to cologne where um, professor Böckstiegel was at the time one of the best known arbitrators in germany he was head of the iranian claims tribunal and yeah from there i worked at his institute then wrote my phd with him uh, he in, introduced me to Julian Liu in, in the UK, where I took classes in arbitration. And from there on, you just got into that. Yeah? So I have done one of the careers where I normally advise students not to do it. Yeah, focus very early on what's on arbitration. But it worked out quite well, because originally I wanted to become a fully qualified professor. Yeah? So I'm not sure whether I would advise someone in private practice to put everything on arbitration. Yeah. Okay, wow. Great story. And yeah, you studied with the best, it's amazing. Um, now, Stefan, what would you say is the most useful skill to have uh, as a legal practitioner uh, and how can you develop that skill? Probably as a practitioner, in my view, uh, the most important skill are communication skills. Uh, you have, on the one hand, you have the client, you have to convince the client that perhaps certain things the client sees one way are better handled in a different way. And you have to communicate with the client also that maybe the outcome is not what he or she expects. On the other hand, you have to talk to the other side in negotiations, but also to talk to the tribunal in disputes and convince them that your client's view is the view to adopt and it's one of the things which i always liked both with pierre Lalive and also with Böckstiegel. they had a an ability to have a very complex fact pattern and to explain it in a very simple way yeah? and i always admired also at university the professors where you left the class and had the impression oh it's all easy and then you started reading about that and you said wow uh, it's not so easy but they presented it in a way that everyone got it. And that is something which I at least see in my life as an arbitrator very often. You are dealing with extremely complicated manner. And if you have someone who is able really to explain these difficult issues with a clear story and in a very well structured way, and there you see I'm German, I like structure, um, mm -hmm. It helps incredibly. Yeah? And I'm not an expert, for example, in corrosion. And if I have two experts there explaining things to me, I somehow have to follow one of them. And probably both of them have a point of view. Yeah? You learn very, very early onwards in the arbitration, there's hardly ever black and white. It's very often a gray area. Yeah? And you can see it that way or that way. And it's very often the communication skills um, which help you to convince that. And that's perhaps also why you very often see the same experts over and over again, yeah? because also clients have been very impressed by them. The same applies for lawyers. Yeah? You know, 
there are some lawyers you're looking forward really to the opening statement uh, because it's something joyful. Uh, you listen to something, they summarize the thousand pages of submissions in an hour or two in a way you said, wow. Uh, so, true. so that is one thing. The second thing is just for me, always a natural curiosity. Yeah. So don't take anything for granted. Yeah? In particular, if you work internationally, yeah? there's there's so many things. Yeah. Also in science, things we consider today to be the standard. Tomorrow we will realize that things are different. I just had my my youngest child just left home after finishing her, uh, or her school, and she had as a major biology, uh, and half of the stuff she has learned at school didn't even exist when I finished my school. Yeah? So that is fascinating for me. Yeah? And some of the stuff I learned, she told me, no, it's different now. Yeah, We have found out that this is not the correct way. Yeah? Wow. So, yeah, and yeah. the last and most important thing is what I always also tell my students, love your job. Uh, it's if you love your job, uh, you're probably good at it. Uh, you put in the extra effort yeah, and it's not a burden upon you, but you just enjoy it. Well, speaking about enjoying it, Stefan, as you reflect on your experiences, what would you say you love the most about arbitration? Again, there's so much. Uh, uh, I can tell you, I normally start my lectures by telling the students that I'm doing arbitration since 25 years now, or nearly 30 years by now, and there's not a single day I've regretted that. Uh, so every day you've learned something new. And what I like in arbitration, probably to sum up the three most important things are First, it's an intellectually very interesting topic. Yeah, you are at the borderline of procedure law and substantive law uh, already when you deal with the procedural issues. Yeah, arbitration is based on an agreement, but at the same time, it's a procedure. And then you deal with a lot of different topics uh, on the merits. Yeah, at least that's what I do. Yeah? There may be some arbitrators who only do M&A, post-M&A disputes. Yeah? But for me, the interesting part is doing post-M&A disputes, construction dispute here, and uh, something there. It may not be the most economical way of doing things because you very often spend more time getting used to the problem, reading into the problem. But that's the benefit of not being in a big law firm, but being a professor, being your own boss that you decide what you're interested in and you can spend as much time, largely as you want to, on a topic if you're interested in that. Second is the international element, yeah, that you come with a very German view. And I always explain to my students also the moot court case is written by a German with a German mindset. But at the same time, you see that the same problems are approached differently in different jurisdictions yeah and the outcome is very often much more convincing than the outcome in Germany or we come to the same outcome with a complete on a completely different way and that's also one of the things when when I'm visiting a university I really enjoy sitting in lectures I'm giving myself normally uh, to see how someone else approaches the problem and perhaps explains a decision even by the German Supreme Court in an entirely different way, yeah, which I'd never seen before, where I would say that's probably not the way the German Supreme Court came to the conclusion, yeah, because they follow a different path. But there's a different explanation for that, which is often more convincing than the more technical approach we have taken. And last but not least, just the people. Yeah? Meeting people like you and other ones at the moot court or in arbitration, there are so many fascinating colleagues, yeah, and it's always a pleasure uh, to spend some time with them. So, as I said, overall, there's so many things, but I can only repeat, I enjoy it from the first day until now. Yeah? That's wonderful, yeah. <laughs> Stefan, now what would you say your role as professor enhances your role as arbitrator and vice versa? I would say definitely. Uh, uh, on the one hand, let's start with the role of the arbitrator. Yeah, At least on the procedural side, yeah, they have very few problems I haven't dealt with. Yeah, So you look at certain things and you also have the type of academic interest. That means 
you're not only deciding a particular case, but you perhaps go a little bit the extra mile, look about what's the underlying feature, what is the structure, whatever. Uh, and also, since arbitration is a complicated topic, you also learn to some extent to explain complicated fact patterns to the parties, uh, participants in an arbitration in an understandable way. And uh, for me, the best in an arbitration is normally if the parties in the end ask you, can you give us some evaluation at the beginning uh, or at the end of a hearing and say, where do we stand? And then in the end, they settle on the basis of what you have explained to them or just by asking questions very often also reveals in which way the tribunal is thinking. Uh, and for me, the best arbitration is one where I don't have to write an award uh, because the parties um, understand where the tribunal stands and uh, in the end uh, settle the case. Um, that is one way, but definitely also the other way. I think as a professor, a lot of the cases I couldn't imagine I see in practice. Uh, uh, and when I would just be a professor without any practical experience, the students would always say, yeah, okay, that's someone yeah. the, in the ivory tower, you have come up with very strange ideas. Yeah, uh, that's a true academic, yeah, but no connection with reality. But reality is much more colorful than most students imagine. Uh, and a lot of things, there's hardly anything which you haven't seen in practice. Yeah. And that is also a lot of the moot court cases, yeah, actually come from real cases I had. Um, there was some years ago, there was a question concerning the uh, exchange rate. Yeah. And you wouldn't imagine that in a contract, in an international contract, multi million contract, they haven't thought about the exchange rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, they were closely connected companies. Then one of the companies was sold, and suddenly, yeah, the exchange rate played a major role. Yeah, and you could argue it one way or another. And it also gives you some credibility with the students. Yeah, if I say I've seen that in practice, they believe me. If I would say, yeah, that would be a quite interesting case, they are probably not believing you. Uh, okay. And um, it also, and that is for me for the teaching side also important. It's not only about the law. In practice, law is 50%. The other 50% is really trying to convince the people about your view and also techniques and tactical considerations. To what extent am I submitting a full-fledged statement of claim at the beginning or just a request for arbitration and all that? I think it makes the lectures more interesting for the students if they get, I would say, the full picture. Yeah? Not only the picture, this is the technical legal side, but also what you see in practice. Wow, that must be fun to study arbitration with you. I'm not sure. Yeah, they, they always complain it's too much work. Oh, I mean, <laughs> work hardly hard, you know. So, uh, Stefan, you are one of three directors of the Beast competition. Could you share with us what your role entails, what you are most excited for in the competitions? 30th year anniversary? My role is primarily that of writing the case. Yeah, so every year I have to come up with an idea which keeps students occupied for six months. And students, and sometimes you have the impression a whole Vismut industry by now. Yeah, you have coaches and you have, uh, the moment the problem comes out, you have some law firms which organize uh, events for the students uh, to explain to them uh, the legal problems. So that is my major task. Yeah? We have separated the task between the three directors a little bit. And I took the one with the, with the case because yeah, of the academic background and uh, teaching uh, interest. And um, that is usually I select uh, ideas from things I read from my own cases. And that's one of the policies I have. I accept every CSG case. I would say normally I decline 50% of the cases I get offered as an arbitrator. And uh, every CSG case, yeah, no matter how small it is, yeah, uh, which from economics side wouldn't make sense, I accept that. This year was the first time I had to make an exception. Um, but normally I accept that. And 
sometimes you could say I could immediately take the entire file, yeah, submit it to the Vismut case, yeah, if it weren't for confidentiality reasons. Yeah? And what, as a professor, you also try to teach the student a little bit more than just the two arbitration problems. So you always try to have perhaps at the beginning dead alleys where they go into, read into something and then realize it's not really relevant. Yeah, So make it a little bit broader than just the two topics and also give them a little bit structure yeah, that you see and that when they argue, you have the good teams which deal with the particular topic but you have the excellent teams which can put the topic into the real structure of arbitration, the underlying principles, yeah, how you argue that. So for example, this year we have as one of the underlying principles, uh, the good phase, venere contrafactum proprium estoppel, whatever you say. Yeah? So what happens to a state party which signs an arbitration agreement but does not have the internal uh, authorization to do so and what happens if the other party may know about that uh, how do you balance these conflicting ideas and really to make a good argument in these cases is very often you have to not look at the individual problem but go a little bit broader and that is also why some of the teams yeah, have developed a certain strategy and they're usually quite successful with that yeah. Let's take, for example, Ottawa. Yeah, they always come come up with a very good idea, and that's the way they teach it there. Okay. And second, you also try to find something which is factually interesting. Yeah, either a new development in um, in a certain area, scientific area, or something which may be controversial, such, for example, last year the um, palm oil, yeah, where you had a lot of environmental groups in Europe being string, strictly opposed to palm oil. And then I, when I called the Malaysian Producers Association to get some background information about the production of palm oil prices whatsoever, we had a quite interesting talk for three and a half hours. And then at a certain point in time, he said, yeah, now I'm off the record. I tell you something, uh, what I think there. And then the guy was clearly going ahead telling us, and probably rightly so, yeah, if you want uh, palm oil, yeah, which is uh, produced, certified in a particular way, we can do it, but just pay three times as much, yeah, and don't blame us for it. Yeah, uh, you have already destroyed all your, your rainforests, yeah, and for us, it's necessary to survive. Yeah, and so... That is also something where students very often at home are very enthusiastic about certain things, but then just look one way uh, and they don't see the other side. Uh, so here we see the destruction of the rainforest and definitely we have to do something with that. But on the other hand, we also have to put ourselves into the shoes of the people producing it. And when they say that is probably the only way we can get out of poverty. Uh, so. That is something we also had on several several occasions, yeah, where you said uh, from here sitting in Germany, where you have a well, uh, everything is quite well organized, it's very easy to say you have to do it this way. But if you live in a different environment, it may be different. So that is the second thing I always try to do. And yeah, then last but not least, um, what I like most and what I like most of the 30s is meeting friends again. Uh, uh, you have made friends all over the world, yeah, and um, a lot of them come every year, uh, and some of them are coming there in the 80s, and they're coming year by year, yeah, sometimes to give something back. They have been fairly successful and say, okay, that's the only way we can, can contribute. And that's also quite nice that if something goes wrong, is for example, there's a team yeah, which we want to have there. And the team has their main sponsor is not paying up. Yeah? Sometimes you can call these people and say, we have a team from X, Y, Z. Yeah? It would be great if you could not only come here, spend a week here, but also sponsor the team. Yeah? And that is the fun part of that. Oh, that's so wonderful. the most important thing in the 30th anniversary is I will see the people in Vienna again. And I hope to see many of them. Yes, yes. I think 30 years, that's a huge achievement. And I'm sure it's pretty exciting to see so much people yeah. after so long. Yeah. yeah. 
I remember when I did the VC, it was the 20th edition. It was 2013. And then the year yeah. after, it was an Obi Twitter. Uh, and we did, then it was, uh, I mean, it was so massive. Uh, you could barely enter like the opening ceremony. So I really wonder how the 30th is going to be. Hmm. Uh, I like that you said earlier on, um, you know, coming up with something to keep students busy for at least six months. You must be just beside yourself when you see what they come up with, what they do with it. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. That is, has, I, I remember I was involved in the 20s for the first time as a semi director. Eric was still running largely the show, but he had a problem, health problem. Yeah. So in the last moment we had to get in, there were some mix ups. Yeah. And I remember the first case I wrote, yeah, when I got the request for clarification, there were more than 2000 requests for clarifications, yeah, I was completely shocked, yeah? and then I read through them, yeah, and sort of, okay, you forgot that, you forgot that, yeah, after 10 years doing that, you get a little bit more relaxed, yeah, you know that at least 60% of them are completely beyond, yeah, uh, what you, what is relevant for the case, yeah, but for a student, it's an entirely new area yeah? and they start with something and think it's really important yeah only to realize after let's say three months yeah that's not really something they're going into and that's a little bit they all come with different backgrounds they may have just heard company law and then they have a lot of ideas of brazilian company law yeah which may play a role in that case yeah? and you get 20 case questions about company law yeah primary from brazilian company uh, brazilian teams and you know okay that is an issue in Brazil. Um, and But they also, let's say, 10% of the questions where I say, okay, I completely overlooked that. Yeah, I come with a German mindset. I had this two or three topics in mind, yeah, but didn't look sufficiently broad. And the same applies also whenever I write the arbitrator's brief, I read around through around 30 memoranda, uh, uh, see what issues they have mentioned. And there's a quite funny uh, thing uh, about I think five years ago, whatever, we had a conflict of law issue there. And um, I read through that and realized that no one really picked that up. Yeah? And to be honest, it for the outcome of the case, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the arbitrator's brief and decided not to mention it yeah, in, a, in the arbitrator's brief, just not to... Uh, to basically create uh, problems for non-conflict lawyers. And the moment I sent it out, um, three hours later, I had the first professor <laughs> with an email writing to me that he thought at least I understood conflict of laws and he was shocked that I had overlooked that problem. And then I could write back to him and say, I haven't overlooked the problem. It's just no one else sees it the German way. Uh, uh, everyone else is... Uh, just looking at the outcome and for the outcome it doesn't matter on base of what theory you apply that and then professor schwenzer in the preparation for the final she was part of the final she came up with the same thing i said ingeborg probably the students will not get it yeah uh, they have not pleaded it and it's really a german issue yeah which is completely correct she what she had in mind was completely correct yeah and again, she raised it in the file, and I had the impression none of the teams re did really know what, what she was getting at. Yeah? Uh, because it's really, conflict of laws is very often very technical, yeah? and in particular, if it's structured the way we do it here in Germany. Yeah? And for the students, the outcome was the same. So wow. there are some stories. Yeah? I could probably t tell you the entire day, I feel an entire day with stories yeah, about yeah, the culture. Yeah. And things where you uh, had something completely different in mind, and things came out quite differently. Huh? Yeah, no, but from a comparative law perspective, it's it's fascinating, really. Yeah. It really is. Um, and more about the moot now, uh, Stefan. Um, so we know mooting enhances advocacy. Uh, uh, a lot of students do it. Uh, I personally did it and really enjoyed it. Um, what would you now tell to students who are not sure, who hesitate? Uh, um, to do the route, uh, how would you convince them? Yeah. I would just tell them you're missing out on a unique opportunity. Uh, uh, so you hear so many students yeah, who say that was really 
that part in my studies which made law interesting for me uh, and there was also something which which happened to me when i took over the uh with patricia and chris from eric uh, my family was or my wife was not extremely happy about that yeah because she said you're working anyway six days a week uh, you have three children yeah and now you take on the mood but then we were standing in st petersburg queuing up to get into um an exhibition then a student came to to us and she said she wanted to introduce herself she was the coach from a team from in the middle of russia somewhere and uh, she just wanted to thank me yeah because that she was about to leave law and that mood court yeah was for her that point which kept her in law and got her interested in that and since then she's coaching the team from the university of omsk yeah and uh after she left, my wife said, okay, forget what I, whatever I said about okay. that, yeah, just skip one of the arbitrations, yeah, or do two arbitrations less and keep on working on the mood, yeah, because it sees that these people are so enthusiastic about that. And what I would tell every student is you learn on three, three in three areas. The first one is natural legal issues, yeah, you have something there, you learn about arbitration, you learn about the CSG. And for us, it's always an educational exercise. For the students, it's naturally a competition. And, but the competition element really forces you or brings a lot of students to go the extra mile. Yeah, you're, you're coming very often unprepared to lectures, but you're not going to Olympic Games without proper training. Yeah, that means they go spend nights in the library, whatever. Yeah, so that brings them... Um, into an area where they have probably at the end of the mood court, they have more experience than 90% of the practitioners I know. It also shows you what you can achieve in a topic which was completely unknown to you. And at the end of that, you are at least a semi-expert yeah, if you had done it properly. So that's the one side. Yeah? The second thing is, as you said, advocacy. You learn skills yeah, if it's done properly. And it's now, that's the, one of the good parts of the pandemic. I'm pretty sure that we will have a lot of online coaching and online pre moods yeah where everyone irrespective of where they're based yeah whether it's Kathmandu or uh, anywhere else where they don't have the resources and don't get the coaches in they can have online coaching the maa provides teams with coaches whatever yeah and you benefit from that and they can teach you the skills at least they cannot teach you the law but at least the skills tell you what is the way you should present something yeah and there again is something quite interesting the german will tell you a and the other one will tell you b and you realize that in real in my real arbitration if i have a tribunal composed of three germans maybe my presentation skill is a different one or different presentation skill needed than having a t a tribunal composed of three chinese or three brazilians because already the coaches tell you something entirely different yeah, and that's what i always tell the students I can give you my view, yeah, and maybe I have more experience than you, yeah, but maybe my view is not the correct one for you, yeah, maybe there's a different view which fits better for you. And last but not least, you make friends all over the world, yeah, and there's so many, yeah, mood couples, mood babies, not from <laughs> the mood itself, but from subsequent times, yeah, but um, when I see how my assistants travel the world, yeah, uh, meeting people everywhere yeah it's great to see yeah? and it's also great to see how open they are to helping and seeing the needs of someone so you miss out on that if you don't do that it's a lot of work definitely it may take your studies may take longer but what i've heard from the students um, and that's probably not an objective view because they only come to me if they say it's great yeah uh, but what i've heard they all say it has been a life-changing experience it's such an amazing yeah. experience. So exciting. Um, Stefan, I just I just love your passion for this mood. Um, can you share with us an experience that has been most impactful in your career? Although I kind of feel I know what you might say. <laughs> <laughs> yep. First of all, that was that at school, that discussion where I felt really treated badly yeah? and I thought, OK, uh, you should know better yeah? uh, and you should be able to defend your positions better. Yeah? Then it was the um, 
perhaps the time in Geneva, uh, when, when I studied in Geneva, where you, you got interested in this international topics and then seeing someone where, again, a lot of, the, a lot of students loved Pierre Lalif, yeah, because it was very clear, very structured. Others just, I couldn't say hated him, yeah, but they thought he was just rushing in, rushing out, yeah, and the impression was he was not really for them not interested in the students so the first thing was also to see there's one person which you adore for the way he teaches and also understand but other people dislike that yeah so what i always tell my students then is be yourself you will never be liked by everyone yeah and if you have a certain conviction stand for that and that was probably in geneva and then again came probably with the mood where you said okay um there's so much in it, what you learn yourself, yeah, that um, this natural curiosity, which I always had, I think was even enhanced by now working really internationally with people from all over the places and seeing so many people who really are engaged in a way that they say they want to give something back. Yeah? So there are a number of the professors, older uh, lawyers who come now and say, I want to educate the next generation. And uh, I do that not because I want an additional arbitration, whatever, but because but I really enjoy it. Yeah. And now you always have to like answer my next question, <laughs> giving a great life advice, be yourself, like it's the, one of the best advice you can give. Um, but yeah, no, actually my question is, what is the best piece of advice you have received? Uh, and then maybe share with us another piece of advice uh, to give to Mutis and young lawyers. Yeah, so what I have received and what, what was also perhaps something which comes from my history in the family is you always, if you have your values and your views, stand for it and fight for it. It may not always be easy. Yeah, You may not be liked by everyone, but that's not your main purpose. Your main purpose is you're convinced about something and fight for that. Yeah, And in the end, and be passionate about it. Yeah? So uh, you reach much more if you enjoy what you do and if you can convince the other ones that you really stand for that. Yeah, People may disagree with you, but at least they see you're honest in what you believe in. Yeah? And um, that is something which I really have a problem now is that you have the society in a lot of jurisdictions or a lot of countries is just split entirely yeah? and you're not really talking to each other anymore yeah? so or when you talk to each other every discussion is already seen as a kind of microaggression whatever yeah? uh, for me coming from a university yeah, that is the area where you really have different views and you should exchange the views and try to find out which one is the better one you know if i cannot convince you I can nevertheless, if you have an entirely different view, I can respect you as a human being. Okay? Yes. But I see a tendency everywhere, whether it's the United States or also in Germany, where people are moving more and more apart and you're just with your small group. And yeah, we had that also sometimes, well, at least last year with the mood court, there was a considerable shitstorm we got here uh, because we decided to allow Russian students in. Yeah? And at the same time, we brought all the Ukrainian teams to to Vienna, yeah, trying to find support for them. And um, and I think we made a. In the end, it turned out quite well that the Russian students, they withdraw themselves, yeah, because a lot of them were against the war, yeah? and we really had also to convince them to say, think about what you do, yeah, because a lot of people underestimate, yeah, when they live in a democracy where you can have a free speech, yeah. What it means in other jurisdictions where basically everything you say can put you 10 years into prison yeah, because you're doing something uh, which is prohibited by the law and i would always stand up and my children were shocked yeah that i was called nazi or whatever collaborateur on the internet yeah and the shitstorm we had there but that is what i always say if you have a conviction stand for it fight for it Preferably, it's a good conviction. Yeah, it's. Uh, but uh, also respect if other people have a different view. And for me, the best advice I would give to or to a lawyer: be curious. Yeah, it's just it's so interesting out there, and always try to learn something new. 
Yeah. Stefan, this has been a very insightful interview. Uh, just great. But we cannot let you leave without asking you our bonus question, which I'm sure you're aware of since you've been watching previous episodes. So we'd like for you to share with us your theme song that gets you going, ready for that beef meat or an arbitration hearing. Um, <laughs> That's difficult. You can't say that. Yeah. No, difficult. Really to say, it really depends on my mood. Yeah, in a way, uh, I'm I'm fairly open. Also, what music means. I I just got from a friend of mine. He has written a something about how we made a, a school journal at the time yeah and what type of music i heard at the time yeah and i was amazed that he remembered that uh, I, I wouldn't listen to that anymore yeah it was at the time heavy metal yeah so no now it's more with age yeah you get a little bit uh yeah calmer but i would say i always enjoyed uh, one of the things of one of the songs i always liked very much was stairway to heaven yeah um stairway but that heaven. is not really getting you going for uh for uh arbitration if you have to fight something there but uh that was one of my favorite favorite songs yeah nice i love it it's it's calming yeah yeah <laughs> So yeah, okay. that's the good thing. If if you're the arbitrator, you have to be calm. Yeah. Yeah. You're not the counsel. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Stefan. This has been yeah. a delight. Yeah, absolutely. Thank pleasure. you very much for having me. Very yeah. good to see you. And I hope to see you in Vienna then. Absolutely. Yeah. Bye. We would just like to thank Stefan once more time for joining us here at Arbitration Life. And for more Arbitration Life, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at Arbitration Life.